CYC is a free channel that presents the Word of God for everyone. Your support will help us to continue the mission. Visit our website, cycnow.com. Even a dollar will make a difference. Hello and welcome to your program called Hyperlink where we will get together and answer your questions on a variety of teenage topics that affect both you and your parents. So if mum or dad are around, let them join you today for this touching topic. We left you in our previous episode talking about teen friendship. Today, however, we will discuss together the issue of teen suicide. But first, let's go and see what the youth and their parents think of teen suicide. If you're thinking of suicide, then you've had thoughts and you've had, if you had to go through bad relationships, going through bad ways, addiction, drugs, that all can lead to suicide. So signs to stopping people from suicide is by leading them to Christ, showing them the Bible, Ishbeya, all this. Thank you for your participations and your personal opinions. Are you feeling that life isn't worth living anymore? Do your problems seem too big to handle? Does it seem that no one cares? Sometimes these feelings of despair or apathy cause people to think about suicide. Now let's go and answer the first question. What does the Bible say about suicide? Your life is a gift. However, some Christian youth have at one time or another contemplated ending their life by committing suicide. Christian or not, there are a few that see suicide as anything less than a tragedy. Suicide is not a new idea. The Bible records five suicides. Let's see what they are. Saul was stressed out, unable to live up to certain expectations. He felt rejected and a failure. 1 Samuel 31 4. Saul's armor barrier, through impulse, he wanted to die with his king. 40% of teenage suicide is impulse. Ahitophel was bitter because his advice was not followed, so he killed himself. King Zimri had a problem with authority and was rebellious. He also killed himself. Depressed Judas felt trapped by materialism and guilt and he killed himself. Remember, our body is a temple for God to live in. God is pretty clear throughout the Bible that we are to take care of our bodies and in 1 Corinthians we are urged to see our bodies as a temple of God and it is clear that God will judge those that destroy that temple. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you are brought as a price, therefore honour God with your body. Let's move on to our next question. What does the Bible say about taking your own life? God has a great plan for your life. God has created us in His image. He created us for a purpose. God has a specific plan in mind for everyone. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and the future. God's plan is for life, not death. The Bible teaches that both physical and spiritual deaths are the result of our sin and disobedience to God, but eternal life is a gift to those who receive it. St. Paul says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus taught that death and destruction are the work of the thief, Satan. He said, the thief comes only to steal and destroy. 
John 8.44 says that Satan is the murderer and the father of lies. The feelings of despair that lead to suicide are caused by some of his lies. Jesus wants us to have life, he said. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Life belongs to God. It is never our place to take our own life or someone else's life, for we all belong to God. And we mentioned before in 1 Corinthians 6.19. Let's move on to our next question. Is suicide considered a murder? While we consider that our body is a temple and we should care for it, God also tells us that we are not to murder. In the Ten Commandments, God clearly says you shall not murder. We are not only prevented from murdering others, but many believe this verse also tells us that we are not to murder ourselves. St. Paul says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Move on to the next question. Can you tell me what the warning signs are for people who are contemplating on suicide? Yes, sure. The following is not the full list of warning signs, but only some examples. Talking or joking about suicide. Statements about being reunited with a deceased loved one. Statements about hopelessness, helplessness or worthlessness. Example. It doesn't matter. I won't be around much longer anyway. I wish I could just disappear. Preoccupation with death. For example, recurrent death themes in music, literature or drawings. Writing letters or leaving notes referring to death or the end. Suddenly happier or calmer. Loss of interest in things one cares about. Unusual visiting or calling people one cares about, saying their goodbyes. Giving possessions away, making arrangements, setting one's affairs in order. Self-destructive behaviour. Alcohol, drug abuse, self-injury or mutilation, promiscuity. Risk-taking behaviour, like reckless driving, excessive speeding, carelessness around bridges, cliffs or balconies, or walking in front of traffic. Having several accidents resulting in injury. Close calls of brushes with death. And obsession with guns or knives. So if you feel that you know of someone who is behaving in this manner, please act with wisdom and go and see a professional suicide therapist who will diagnose his case for you. It needs lots of prayers on the altar. St. John says, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Move on to our next question. I know of someone that is thinking of committing suicide. What can I do to help her? If you or someone you know is contemplating suicide, you know that life can seem worse than any hell you may or may not face. Depression and anguish can be overwhelming, but know that those things do not come from God. While God allows us to suffer at times, look at Job who suffered quite a bit. He's always there for us to seek his comfort. God does not mean for us to be alone in this lifetime. We need to seek Him when we feel overwhelmingly lonely, depressed or in pain. Christ said, Come to me all who labour in pain and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lonely in heart and you will find rest for your souls. God put those people in those positions to be our guides and His voice when we have trouble hearing His voice. Keeping the pain and sadness inside only makes it worse 
and it is not what God would want. Talking it out can be the first step in getting back to the life of God wants for you. Pray and talk are God's ways of taking us out of feeling hopeless and helpless. Let's move to our next question. Does the person who committed suicide go to hell? Many Christian youth believe that if they commit suicide, then they will go to hell for the act. However, the Bible never explicitly says that committing suicide will result in eternal damnation. We, the Coptic Orthodox Church, believe that the person who committed the suicide and is fully aware of what he or she has done, then this is a killing act. So this person who died did so in his sin and was unable to repent from it. This is why our church does not pray on him after his suicide. However, the other question is where the person's state of mind is when he or she commits the suicidal act. Did that person no longer have a relationship with Christ? Was it just a moment of giving in to an enemy's words? Or was he or she mentally ill? It is hard to know. Move on to the next question. If suicide isn't the answer, then what is? The solution to despair and hopelessness is not suicide, but faith in God. David the Psalmist says, We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Christ promises that He will give us rest from our problems. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Tell someone. Tell your parents, your brothers or sisters, your teacher or school counsellor, your priest or youth servant, that you are thinking about suicide. If a friend tells you that he or she is serious about suicide, then you need to tell someone who is responsible and can help. Accept Christ as your only Saviour. When we accept Christ, God gives us a brand new life and sees us as completely holy and righteous. St. Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Because of God's salvation, through the death of Jesus on the cross, we can have assurance of eternal life with God. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. So the answer is only God who comforts. Let's move on to see what the, our church fathers have to say about suicide. St. Augustine. The Christians have no authority for committing suicide in any circumstances whatever. Suicides are utterly prohibited by the scriptures. Suicide is a detestable and damnable wickedness. Certainly he who kills himself is a homicide and so much the guiltier of his own death as he was more innocent of that offence for which he doomed himself to die. For Judas, when he killed himself, killed a wicked man, but he passed from this life chargeable not only with the death of Christ, but with his own. For though he killed himself on account of his crime, his killing himself was another crime. St. Peter says, Do you think, O woman, that those who destroy themselves are set free from torments, and not rather that the souls of those who lay violent hands upon themselves are subjected to greater punishments. Put these thoughts in your mind. Let's move on to the story on suicide. 
an Aussie story for all our brothers and sisters in Australia. Years ago, a hard-working man took his family from New York State to Australia to take advantage of a work opportunity there. Part of this man's family was a handsome young son who had aspirations of joining the circus as a trapeze artist or an actor. This young fellow, bidding his time until a circus job or even one as a stag hand came along, worked at the local shipyards which bordered on the worst section of town. Walking home from work one evening, this young man was uh, attacked by five thugs who wanted to rob him. Instead of just giving up his money, the young fellow resisted. However, they defeated him easily and proceeded to beat him to a pulp. They mashed his face with their boots and kicked and beat his body brutally with clubs, leaving him dead. When the police happened to find him lying on the road, they assumed he was dead and called for a morgue wagon. On the way to the morgue, a policeman heard him gasp for air and they immediately took him to the emergency unit of the hospital. When he was placed on a gurney, a nurse remarked to her horror that this young man no longer had a face. Each eye socket was smashed, his skull, legs and arms fractured, his nose literally hanging from his face. All his teeth were gone and his jaw was almost completely torn from his skull. Although his life was spared, he spent over a year in the hospital. When he finally left, his body may have healed, but his face was disgusting to look at. He was no longer the handsome youth that everyone admired. When the young man started to look for work again, he was turned down by everyone just on account of the way he looked. One potential employer suggested to him that he join the freak show at the circus as the man who had no face. And he did this for a while. He was still rejected by everyone and no one wanted to be seen in his company. He had thoughts of suicide. This went on for five years. One day he passed the church and sought some comfort there. Entering the church, he encountered a priest who saw him sobbing while kneeling at a bench. The priest took pity on him and took him to the rectory where they talked at length. The priest was impressed with him to such a degree that he said that he would do everything possible for him that could be done to restore his dignity in life if the young man would promise to be the best Christian he could be and trust in God's mercy to free him from his torturous life. The young man went to Mass and had communion every day and after thanking God for saving his life asked God to only give him peace of mind and the grace to be the best man he could ever be in his eyes. The priest through his personal contact, was able to secure the service of the best plastic surgeon in Australia. There would be no cost to the young man, as the doctor was the priest's best friend. The doctor, too, was so impressed by the young man, whose outlook now on life, even though he had experienced the worst, was filled with good humour and love. The surgery was a miraculous success. All the best dental work was also done for him. The young man became everything he promised God he would be. He was also blessed with a wonderful, beautiful wife, many children, and success in an industry which would have been the furthest thing from his mind as a career, if not for the goodness of God and the love of the people who cared for him. This he acknowledges publicly. So there is still hope out there, and there are still people who do care.
Mm-hmm.